succeeding. Trombone off piece. I can't even make it work, it's just too big. Yeah, it doesn't really work. Just too big of a mouthpiece for the instrument. Okay, I'm going to try here pulling off the largest mouthpiece um, silicone cup and putting on to the base mouthpiece shank and cup structure the one that they call the alto, but it's really bigger than an alto horn, I think. This is probably going to be really bad. It feels like I'm extremely in the basement with this one. Almost like it would work better an octave higher. Let me try the trumpet mouthpiece, which is, I think, a bit bigger than a real trumpet mouthpiece cup. And this is really going to be bad because I have no armature for such a small mouthpiece, but I'll still try it. Today I'm going to talk about this instrument I just bought. Um, it's made by Nuvo. I believe that's a British company. At least they say their products are designed in in England or at least in Great Britain. And uh, 
made with skill or whatever they say in China. So designed in England, made in China. And this is one of several instruments they have. They have a plastic clarinet, a plastic uh, saxophone, which I've heard works fairly well, um, various other things. This instrument might be the newest one they have or thereabouts. As near as I can tell, this was released sometime around 2019, so three, four years old at the time of making this video as far as being a product. Anyway, so it's not exactly a review, it's not exactly an unboxing. I'm just going to talk about this instrument in whatever way occurs to me as I go along. So this is a little backpack carrying case. This is the back side and there are straps that come with it that'll go on to here so you can backpack it. Also a carrying handle. And this is some sort of a, I think it's probably just foam. It's almost like dashboard material. Um, contoured, kind of soft case with a uh, foam mesh back and a zippered top. Okay, so taking the horn out of the case, there's a fairly nicely done manual with just the basics on what all the parts are, how to set it up to be in B flat or in C, changing the slides for those two configurations, how to take the valves apart, how to change the um, the cups, essentially the silicone rims and cups assembled onto the mouthpiece body, talking about that and then uh, fingering charts for fingering uh, treble clef and fingering and bass clef and these charts are set up or at least this one, the beat, uh, bass clef one is set up uh, assuming you're in B flat tuning it doesn't say uh, which way it is for the treble clef uh, anyway there's even greater elaboration, uh, fancier, more detailed versions of these diagrams on the website. And here I have a couple of, let's see if I can get them closer. So these form the actual cup of the mouthpiece and the rim. This is a alto horn sort of size and this is uh, actually no I think I've got it wrong here. Let me pull the instrument out of the case. Yeah so this here is the the trumpet size approximately and it just sort of comes off like that leaving you with a shell of a mouthpiece and the throat and the back bore which is basically trumpet sized and that doesn't change and then you could put on the uh, alto size just by sticking it into the body and uh, the back of the cup lines up with the throat it's a very deep mouthpiece in this case because this part is always the same depth so the trumpet mouthpiece is considerably deeper than a real trumpet mouthpiece. The alto might be getting towards French horn depth but a larger diameter. And then finally the so-called bass uh, mouthpiece which you end up with something that's probably about the right depth for a euphonium or trombone but considerably smaller in diameter than a, a trombone baritone euphonium but this is as close as you can get. I found that trying to stick a a trombone with a, a small shank trombone mouthpiece into this instrument 
uh, just doesn't work well at all. I think they figured this is about the largest diameter mouthpiece that'll work on this instrument even half decently. Uh, so you get sort of a two-thirds diameter trombone euphonium cup with about the right depth but again very narrow. So it's always a compromise. I don't think there's anything here that's really ideal either for somebody used to playing trumpet or French horn or alto horn or trombone or baritone or euphonium um, and totally ignore the people who say this is a practice tuba that's incredibly incorrect. Anyway, so let's move on. There's a little zipper pouch inside the inside the bag and one of the things that's in it is uh, well this little Ziploc bag and that has room for the little um, tub of let's see little tub of uh, some kind of I think synthetic grease that you can use to grease the slides. So that goes in the little plastic bag and I think it's a good place to store the other two cups that you're not using at the moment. There's enough room in there. And there's also in here a plastic bag that I just took as a sandwich bag, a Ziploc sandwich bag. And it has the straps that are provided for carrying the case semi backpack style, and just a bottle of uh, Hetman Classic Piston Oil, which is just something I grabbed to keep with this horn for the purposes of oiling the valves. They don't strictly need lubrication, but you'll get a better seal, an air seal or air tightness if you put some sort of lubrication on it. So I have that for this. And then finally, way down in here, there's another bag. And this has the three um, alternate tuning slides, which are marked on them as being for um, tuning it to C making it into a C instrument, in other words. It's not really about tuning it, it's about setting the native pitch of the instrument. So three slides. And uh, I'm going to open this up and show how it's done. So molded plastic slide and then a pair of O-rings on each slide. So that's the only part you really would need to grease, just to keep the O-rings supple, as it says in the instructions. Um, these appear to be identical. They're not marked as to being for the first, second, or third valves. Um, but it does say, kind of hard to see it, but right there it says C, so you can tell it's a C tuning slide. Okay, so that's all you get with it. All right, here's the front of the instrument. Got a fairly ordinary bell, but it's really only about a trumpet size bell. Three piston valves, or at least they look like piston valves. From an operator's perspective, they're piston valves. You've got your mouthpiece receiver and your mouth pipe. And um, I think that may come off. It may be possible to detach this, but I'm not sure. It looks like a coupling here, like there might be O-rings in it, but it's not described in the instructions how to take that off or anything, so I'm going to assume that it stays on there. This is the main tuning slide right here. And just like the other ones, it's a very short stroke. 
and these slides pull really hard so it's not like you could move them while you're playing. There's a little bit of leeway here you can move the slide about that much before it doesn't work properly anymore. Um, not really intended to be used in ensemble. This is also the spit valve right here. It's a elastomeric piece of silicone rubber that wraps around and you can kind of um, flip it up like this and expose the the water drain hole and then slide it back. Or you can just pull the slide out and drain it, but this is where presumably most of the moisture is going to accumulate, uh, especially if you hold the instrument at a bit of an angle, which you probably would while you're playing it. Um, the water accumulated in the valve section will mostly run down this way. Everything from the mouthpiece and the mouth pipe will run down this way. So this is a good location for it. Okay, that's the main tuning slide now. Everything is molded into a couple of sheets of plastic. So there's this sheet here, which um, you can see it's just one layer, everything's in line. And then there's another layer where most everything is in line, up to this coupling point here where things start to go off plane, but everything else here is on line. And this here is a removable tuning slide, so this is not part of the main molding on this, on this layer. And then there's little plastic mountings between them. And I don't think any of this is intended to come apart. I also don't think this is intended to come apart, really. Um, but it does have an elastomeric silicone rubber type of thing around it for I don't know what reason. Not described in the instructions. So your first valve is here, or first valve slide is here, second valve and third valve. As usual, the third valve has a lot more tubing in it, and um, I think the lengths on here are roughly equivalent to a baritone or euphonium as far as the length. I think the bore is small. Again, sort of trumpet size bore, but the length is, I think, closer to a, a baritone euphonium size instrument. Now, the slides are all different for the B flat configuration, which is what I have here. You can see B flat and valve one, B flat or C on valve two. And if you're tuning it to B flat, you pull it out. on. There's a uh, scribe line right there. You can kind of see it. Kind of see it there and over there. So you're supposed to push it in um, for B flat. It's supposed to be at the position where that line is even with the bottom of this. If you're in C then it should be all the way in. So a very tiny amount of tuning. And um, then this is um, the valve three B flat slide. So I'm not really sure why they give you the other three slides because I don't think it's intended to replace this one as there's no water key on the included one. And these I can see because they're shorter uh, for the C tuning. But this one here, you seem to use the same slide and just move it to different positions for C and B flat. So that's not very well explained. But I don't think there is a substantial difference between this slide and the one that's intended for C that would go in the same position. Uh, so move it back out. Um, oh, I, yeah, I understand now because uh, there's also the this other slide which may actually be let's see no I think this is the main tuning slide here I misspoke before this one here is just the water key slide a place for water to accumulate not a tuning slide so um, first valve third valve second valve and then flip her around on the back and then you have 
the B flat uh, main tuning slide, which is kind of long. And it comes off that way. So you've got this long slide, and that gets replaced by the uh, much shorter slide if you're going to put it in C. But of course, you would because this is the, the one that is going to put the entire instrument in a different pitch. And then the other ones are just to make the small changes in length uh, necessary for just tuning the individual valves so they don't have such a dramatic difference in length. Obviously this instrument will be a little cozier to, to hold up next to your body if you're in the C mode because you don't have this wrap around then sticking towards you. So going back, so third valve, first valve, so that's really about all there is to it as far as tuning slides go. The instrument, and I haven't figured this out and, and Nuvo doesn't say, but some other people who have reviewed these have measured them and said that the bore appears to remain constant from the mouthpiece receiver all the way up to about here. At which point you can clearly see that it's starting to go from cylindrical to conical at this point. So in that sense it's very much like a trumpet family instrument. Cylindrical all the way through the horn and then a little bit of uh, flare towards the end. Uh, so this instrument, how big is it? Alright, it measures just about 14 inches or um, 36 centimeters uh, from bell rim to the bottom of the bottom bow. And the entire width from about out there to here is about 11 inches or about 28 centimeters. And the instrument front to back is, well, it's no more than the bell diameter, so that's about five and a half inches or uh, 14 centimeters. Put this on a scale and it's weighing in at um, about 1.6 pounds or 0.7 kilograms. I should also note that the entire instrument, uh, almost every last bit of it is made of um, ABS plastic. So again, I think that's the same material that a lot of 3D printing is using and uh, car bumpers and Lego bricks and stuff like that. I think it's the same material. So a very tough plastic. Uh, it's supposed to be good, you know, even at freezing temperatures, well below freezing temperatures, um, hot temperatures, you don't really have to worry about it. And since it doesn't necessarily use lubricants, you don't really have to worry much about those either. Uh, let's talk about the valves. So um, here's the valve cluster, and these are basically disc valves, although Nuvo calls them rotary valves and they have a patent on it apparently or several patents. You can do every bit of disassembly on these without using tools uh, although these two screws here are basically safety catches. Everything else just comes apart by finger operation. You can actually turn these with a thumbnail although this one is a little tight and I don't want to break my thumbnail so I have opened these with a dime. A dime works really well or a similar small coin, but right now I'm just going to use the screwdriver. So turn them, you know, about uh, half a turn, a little bit less than half a turn. And there's a little tab here you grab and pull this plate up and then this cover comes off and reveals the workings. And here's where you can see that it is a rotary valve system with piston valve keys.
these uh, pieces are all different, so they're numbered one, two, and three, as are the valve rotors, they're all a little different, one, two, and three. And the disassembly is actually a piece of cake, so you just lift these up, they come off, almost like Lego brick links. And the key here is when you're reassembling this, you always want the numbers 1, 2, and 3 to be centered on the left side of the valve and straight across. So that's your basic orientation. Now these valves are molded and uh, they just rotate in position like that. And here's how they work. They're pressed against it's one thing rotating against another, which is why they're disc valves. Um, there's a little knurled nut here, and it's keyed, so you just turn it counterclockwise until it releases from the key, and then you pull it up until it won't go any further. There's a spring there, and then you turn it a little bit back clockwise again, and the bottom disengages from its key. So um, there is this metal shaft. It's probably stainless steel. I don't know. Probably though. So once that spring, which pushes the uh, rotor assembly down, you can just lift this up, and it just has this uh, smooth surface with holes in it, and it goes up against this disc, which is some sort of low friction, very smooth material. Uh, and we're looking at the tubing, so here's the um, mouth pipe, and it comes down here, goes under here. I'm going to use the screwdriver instead. It starts coming up partially into the valve chamber, comes around, goes through the water trap slide here, and then it comes up under this point. And... Um, so the straight through pattern is indeed straight through like this, that's where the air normally goes. And it'll pop up through this hole, you can see the tubing down there. Let's see if I can... Yeah, you can see the tubing coming in there. So it bends and the air comes up through this hole, goes through the valve rotor, and then back down through that hole, and then the tubing bends and goes through here, and you can kind of see right here this raised area. That's the molded in tubing, and it comes to this position, comes up, goes through the rotor, goes back down, goes through here, comes up here, goes through the valve rotor, back down, and then it uh, exits the valve chamber right here and then the rest of it is all just you know it goes around the top and it comes down and then it zigzags back and forth a bunch of times goes through this slide zigzags around and then finally comes out and goes to the bell so fairly simple direct routing I think they did a fairly clever job of orienting the parts to keep it simple and reasonable um, so what do the valve rotors look like? Oh, I, I should say, um, so we know how the air goes straight through. It's along those top holes. But then these ports here, they all just go down. So this one goes down and then bends and goes down this way on the front layer. This one similarly, similarly, similarly. And we've already seen that by going around. So. The first valve is here, it comes out of the rotor, the rotor would be right here, and the next rotor would be here, and the next rotor would be here. So the air, when the rotor is turned, well I should say when the rotor is not turned, it just goes through here, goes through the rotor, straight out, through the rotor, straight out, through the rotor, and straight out. But when you turn this one 90 degrees, now it comes through here, goes down through the rotor, comes back this way, 
goes around the first valve slide back down through the rotor back up and over and repeats for the tubing for one two and three so again very simple and direct routing these little plates here can be oiled just a drop of oil on them uh, and that again that can help slightly uh, with sealing these to make them more airtight um, oh yeah you can kind of see here too here's the porting so you can see how the tube going through this hole bends and goes under and comes up on this hole so let's put this back together again this is valve 3 and I know from the number that it has to go back on in this position now there is a slot you can see that here that has to align with these little nubs on the shaft in order to go on initially if you try putting it on in some other orientation it won't go but these slide around very nicely here and there's the uh, the rubber bumper a silicone rubber bumper and then there's little um, points in the valve chamber which those bumpers can bump against like here and here and then the second valve has a bumper here and here and the third valve has its bumpers I think over here and here so they are different so anyway so number three goes on find the position where the key lets it go in orient it with the three to the left here's number two orient the key drop it in two is on the left this one get one on the left orient the key drop it through and we've got the one two three and then we put the spring back on once again you put the bottom part on there and twist it around till it finds the key and drops down and then twist the top around until it finds the key push it down against the spring and then turn it counterclockwise till it stops so once again we align to get the bottom on oops there the bottom drops on and now we find where the top goes down and then turn it counterclockwise until it stops locks into place there we go all of the uh, valves are in place I think it's possible to put these on 180 degrees apart yeah so I have it set up now so this little uh, bump here is in the lower right but you could just as easily have them 180 degrees out as far as the spring goes and it won't make any difference so this valve will turn the 90 degrees this one will turn 90 degrees that way this one will turn 90 degrees that way so these two turn counterclockwise and this one turns clockwise when actuated and that has to do with the angles that the connecting rods go in so we start out with this guy here it goes over this little nub and into this hole here it just snaps on like that There we go. And then we just um, put this back on. It has, you know, spring clip connectors top and bottom. So you really just put it in there and then push it down until it snaps into position and then turn the the locks 
clockwise until they stop with the slot horizontal. Very easy. and all. Um, I'm having some intonation problems with that, that's probably fairly obvious, and not much to do about it really. Um, I may mess around with these slides a little bit and try to get them a little, little closer, but the ones I was having the most trouble with were the ones that are just using the, uh, the open instrument. I think that was the Happy Hippo or something like that. I vaguely remember that tune. It just popped into my head. I think that was a contest piece when I was in junior high school or something. Why it came back to me just now, I have no idea. So, uh, my overall thoughts on this instrument. It's a pretty dreadful instrument, really, if you're just trying to play it and get good results. This is compromised acoustically, it very clearly is. Uh, it's trying to be a trumpet sized instrument and an alto or French horn sized instrument and a euphonium baritone trombone sized instrument. And again, I believe the length of tubing supports a bass trumpet essentially, but with a smaller bore than a bass trumpet would normally have and then you can put all these different sizes mouthpiece on, none of which really match the instrument, but uh, if you put the trumpet size mouthpiece in there, I think you're probably more like playing in the clarino register uh, in a sense because uh, the tubing is too long for a trumpet and there's no way to shorten it um, and you know Baroque trumpets or natural trumpets are typically, what is it, like four times the normal length of a modern trumpet, but yet they can play up in the stratosphere like a piccolo trumpet, and that's called the clarino register or the clarino technique. And I suspect that may factor into this somehow. Uh, I haven't really analyzed the acoustical physics of it, but the bore is always going to be wrong for something. The mouthpiece is never right, although I think they must have experimented with it to see what they could do to make it work as good as possible in all those different configurations. The ability to put it in C instead of B flat is very handy so you can make it into a non-transposing instrument like a C trumpet. Um, as far as modern mouthpieces fitting this because of the size of the receiver only something like a modern trumpet mouthpiece will fit in here. Anything bigger um, Maybe an alto horn mouthpiece would go in there, kind of, sort of. I've tried different euphonium and trombone mouthpieces, and they only the smallest shank ones will go in just at the 
a little bit before they won't wedge in anymore. The, the taper is too large. And then they are acoustically so mismatched that I couldn't get any kind of usable results. I got the best results using the, the mouthpieces that were included. Um, the, whole, the sound quality is garbage, essentially. Yeah, there's some people, there's a guy on YouTube who is a French horn player and he's using a non-provided mouthpiece, something that he's got that he's found to work and he's playing some stuff on it. And he, he makes it work pretty well in, in that he's hitting the pitches fairly well, but even then there's intonation issues, it's kind of blatty, but he's obviously practiced it and come to an accommodation with it uh, to make it sound probably as good as it's possible to make it sound. I think most people aren't going to get even anywhere near that kind of results with it. Um, I don't think it's a useful practice instrument really, although I guess you could use it to practice fingerings. The valves do move fairly fast. You know, they're not draggy or sluggish. Yeah. The sound is small enough where you might possibly be able to take it along with you if you're traveling all the time and practice in hotel rooms and the sound so small maybe it wouldn't bother anybody. On the other hand, the sound is so awful in this you could probably stick your old socks in the bell and it wouldn't make any difference. Um, the sound is way too small to be useful in an ensemble. You know, if you went in and say, well, I'm going to play this instead of a proper baritone or euphonium or bass trumpet or modern trumpet or any or normal trumpet or anything, I think the director would kick you out and you'd go bouncing along on your butt, you know. <laughs> it's if it's going to be used in any kind of ensemble at all, it's probably going to be some funky little street busking kind of uh situation not any normal ensemble um, and really to get unembarrassing results with it you're gonna have to spend a lot of time with it and pick your pieces probably ones that fit into its range and its capabilities to the highest degree possible you know obviously not anywhere near as good as you would get with a modern instrument or a proper instrument really but in the sense that Nuvo has successfully made sort of a universal brass instrument thing and made the price affordable even just as a novelty you know you might buy your favorite brass player one of these as a Christmas present just sort of as a joke or just to add to their menagerie of oddball instruments I think that's probably a bigger part of the real market for these now I think it's unconscionable that Nuvo um, markets this instrument as something you would give a beginner, you know, somebody who's four years old or six years old or something, so they can start practicing their way up to being a modern, you know, br a brass player. And I think that's just laughable. You know, a kid's going to fart around with it, but, you know, the things, the fundamentals you're going to learn if you study brass for real is you're going to have a proper instrument. The band director isn't going to let you play one of these, they're going to give you a real instrument and you're going to practice long tones, uh, building up your armature, uh, figuring out what you have to do to get the best tone quality, and then slowly adding technique and range on top of that. And this is going to thwart you in all of those aspects. It's not going to help you develop an ear for intonation because it's going to fight you so much. Its pitch is so unstable. Uh, and the tone quality is so bad and the intonation that you can't really fix very well and you know I think this would be just an awful awful choice this instrument I bought it on Amazon for about hundred forty dollars US um, other places seem to be selling it online eBay for hundred fifty hundred sixty dollars I don't think you ever need to pay more than that for it so in that sense, you know, with inflation and the value of the dollar and all that, it's not really expensive. It's really pretty cheap. And, you know, yeah, you can find some applications for it. You know, I'm never going to play this again, certainly. I just bought it because I was curious, and it was my birthday. <laughs> and uh, I decided I was going to buy myself a, a stupid toy and see what it was like. Um, contrast this with...
something I already have a video or two on, which is the Tiger plastic tuba, which is, I think, marketed as Cool Wind or Cool Winds now. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same product. That's actually a viable tuba. It works well in ensemble. You can tune it. It responds well. It has a good sound. Its biggest problem is that it's just kind of creaky and, you know, it's not as comfortable to hold as a real instrument because of some compromises they had to make with where they put the tubing. And the, its worst enemy are the valves they put in it, which are problematic. Uh, but at least saying that, it works really well, uh, and it's quite inexpensive. I think it's over a thousand dollars now, but I think I bought it for like eight hundred plus a hundred for shipping or something. It was very affordable, and it's a viable instrument. I use it when I have outdoor gigs and it's freezing cold. It'll work better than anybody else's tuba there because um, it doesn't get the condensation. Its pitch doesn't go out of whack so much when it gets cold. You know, it's a viable musical instrument. This is probably being thought of by a number of people as a viable plastic euphonium or plastic trumpet or plastic alto horn and I would say pretty much anybody who buys it with that in mind will be bitterly disappointed but still it's not a piece of junk necessarily it's just a weird item with limited application so um, what's what else can I say well this is the black one I think it's probably the most popular color but you can buy it in white and some other colors as well. Um, I think it looks stupid in white. <laughs> the people I've seen with it, it looks more like a toy than this does. Something about making it black makes it look a little classier somehow. Or maybe it's just because you can't see it so well that it leaves something up to the imagination. And, you know, it's like putting paint on something or lipstick on a pig. Anyway, um... Kudos to the design team for the clever things they did, and um, I just wish they had taken this approach and just made a plastic euphonium or a plastic bass trumpet and optimized it to be that, then it would probably be a good thing. You know, you could actually use that for real. Um, as it is, this is just... Um, you know, it's trying to be too many things at once, and it can't be good at any of them. Enough said.